Um, welcome back, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year. Um, let's hope it will be, as I already said, will be a better year than the one that is behind us. Uh, we were just saying, a lot of us and me as well are starting to feel the the pinch now, I must say. it's In London here, it's particularly bad. And... Um, I start. I always. I always start the new semester full of good hope and cheer, and then now I feel like I'm sort of wading through mud, and, it, and it's it's just the second week of uh, of teaching. So I have to see uh, how this term goes, but I am looking forward very much to the time that we will spend together talking about Buber. Uh, that was. It was very. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful um, uh, gathering that we had last term, and let's uh, hope that uh, we can continue that as we explore. Uh, there is Katrina as well. Hi, Katrina. Um, and so I'm very happy to see all of you back and to see some new faces as well. Um, we um, just very briefly by way of introduction, and then I'll hand over to Vic, who will who will kick off the theme for the for the term. Um, last term, we sort of looked at very, you know went into the philosophy of of Buber. We looked at the dialogical principle. Uh, there's Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, we looked at uh, the dialogical principle. We sort of investigated Buber's philosophy and tried to get to the core of, um, the di of dialogical thinking. And that's, of course, something that we will continue in the sense we'll continue to reflect on it and it will continue to ferment and to grow further. And our familiarity with, with what uh, Buber is trying to show to us will increase as the term goes on. But at the same time, we'll take... Um, a slightly uh, so we'll, we'll change our focus a little bit in the in terms in the terms of um, explicitly trying to to have um, we have six sessions six six conversations around the contemporary uh, relevance of of Buber as I explained in the, in the email so that's the plan and we looked at these different um, topics uh, before Christmas. Uh, Vic and I distilled them into six themes. Uh, hi, Nathaniel. Welcome back as well. Um, and we'll, we'll go over that in a, in, in a minute. Um, there is the idea that we could form some working groups around these uh, themes, and um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk about that as well, how to do that. Um, I mentioned last term as well that we um, were going to produce a special issue of the journal European Judaism about Buber's contemporary relevance. And people in the seminar who are interested in contributing to that are very, uh, very much invited to do so. The working groups um, that we want to set up could be used as uh, ways for people to connect to people with uh, similar interests, and it could become the laboratories in which uh, these texts could be written. But you can also do it on your own if you want to. There's absolutely no need to do it in that, in that way. Um, and so we will talk about uh, what these various uh, topics are that we have in mind. Um, and um, as we as we move into this sort of focus on the contemporary uh, relevance of Buber, what does the dialogical thinking have to say to us today in terms of some of the major issues and questions that we are uh, thinking about in in the academy, but also that are sort of challenges in the in the real world outside. And in order to make that transition, uh, we will bring back to mind the discussion that we had about the relation between Heidegger and Buber as the end, because there are some aspects there that might help us to uh, prepare for this um, for this uh, consideration of the contemporary moment in the light of the philosophy of dialogue. And um, uh, Vic will kick us off uh, with that, and we'll uh, will will provide a starting point for our conversation. So, Vic, shall I hand over to you? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um. It's lovely to see everybody and to be back, but these are difficult and fraught times. And um, we need to be able to kind of think in relationship to them. Um, so I wanna say something about the discussion or the background to the discussion of Heidegger and uh, Buber. And I want to talk around the themes of time, history, and ethics. And I want to start with a quotation that influenced um, Buber and gives us some sense of the way his thinking 
contrasts with Heidegger in quite a radical way in terms of not really being a systematic thinker. Um, that he wasn't trying to create a kind of system that we could apply to the present, but was encouraging us to engage with the present that we're living through and at some level to discover the concepts, the ideas that could help us reflect upon the experiences that we're all living through in these kind of difficult times. In his thinking about Heidegger, um, Buber had long been influenced by his relationship with Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher and thinker. And there's one thing that caught a number of things, but one thing that caught um, Kierkegaard's atten that Buber's attention in Kierkegaard was the following phrase, framing. In relationship to their systems, most systematizers are like a person who builds an enormous castle and lives in a shack besides it. They do not live in their own enormous buildings. And in this way, he's also thinking about Hegel and thinking about Heidegger. But spiritually, that is, the, that is a decisive objection. Spiritually speaking, a person's thought, our thought, our thinking, must be the building in which we live. Otherwise, everything is topsy-turvy. So how is it that we can think this moment? So I want to just start by saying something about this moment, this week, both in London but also in Washington, events that are reshaping a lot of our assumptions, a lot of our traditions, a lot of our thoughts about the world we live in, and whether an alternative world, a different kind of world, can be shaped through the learning that we are in some way involved in ourselves. This is our time, but how do we identify it? How do we tell its story? How do we narrate it? It's a time of pandemic, of COVID-19, but it's also striking that in the histories that we learnt, just think for a moment of the histories that you learnt at school, there might have been, or there was a very strong influence on the First World War and the Second World War as historical events that shape our consciousness, our sense of a history that we inherit. But it was very striking if you learn something or how little we learned about the Spanish flu and the pandemic. The histories that we learn don't necessarily include that story. So the experience of living through a pandemic, in fact, challenges and questions our very sense of historical consciousness. What was striking was that that 1918-1919, what was called the influenza, the Spanish influenza, actually started in Kansas in the United States. And it wasn't named or identified because people were to be protected from those histories, the fear, the threat that we are now having a sense of what it was like to live through. And it was only identified as Spanish because in fact, Spain was neutral in the war. The King of Spain died of the influenza and it could be named publicly. So we learn histories selectively, and often our historical consciousnesses are framed through experiences of war and post-war periods. But how do we carry these histories? 
and how do they form us? And in the conversation, the dialogue that I had with Johan just in preparation for this, we were thinking about how was it that Buber's thinking was affected or transformed by his migration to Israel and then the horrendous experiences of the Shoah, the Holocaust. Because there seems to be a way in which some of his language almost remains within the same kind of terms, a kind of generalized humanistic language framed through the notion of I and thou that somehow comes through or is somehow able and is able in quite important ways to speak to us in the present. But we wonder about how it was disturbed or whether it was disturbed. And part of engaging with the discussion that Buber has with Heidegger was his sense that as philosophers, they could somehow meet in a terrain or a territory that had somehow been unaffected or undisturbed. So I'm trying to think about this notion of disturbance and the way in which that disturbance affects language and the way in which if you read Buber, there's a sense that his language somehow remains drawing back to Goethe and drawing back to a humanistic tradition as if that humanistic tradition remains radically unchallenged by the relationship between European modernities, the Holocaust, and also colonial histories of violence. We've lived through in the last week the extraordinary events in Washington and the attempt at a coup to undermine American democracy and the election. So we're coming together to talk about Buba in this very specific moment that we need to be able to reflect about. I don't know how many people have heard the video that was put out by um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is doing the, um, is being, you know, all over the world today. It was kind of seven minute video. Now, what was striking for me, I heard it last night, was Schwarzenegger directly making a connection between his Austrian experience of Kristallnacht and what was going on taking place in the US at this moment. He was saying, this is America's moment of the Kristallnacht, of breaking glass and dangers to the very existence of American democracy in a moment of coup. So we can't not take or recognize, what does it mean to draw? Is that a historical analogy? Or is it a way of thinking differently, seriously, about the dangers and threats in the middle of a global pandemic of the attack on the Capitol building in Washington? How do we see it and how do we recognize the connections? Now, Buba somehow remains both challenged by the events of the Shoah, but also his language doesn't break. And in the conversation I had with Johan, we talked about, the, and this is also in Paul's article, which is the meeting that happened between Paul Celan and Buba in the post-war years, in the early post-war years, where Celan was saying that his language had been fractured and broken. 
and his relationship to German couldn't survive the experience, the horrors of the Shoah, and that his language was at some level broken. And he was challenging Buber for how was it that Buber felt so early in the period after the war, he could return into a dialogue or conversation with Heidegger. Salan felt he couldn't speak German in the same way, and that German itself as a language had been fractured, undermined, compromised through the years of Nazi rule. And in the diary, I don't know if people know, in the, the diary by Klemperer, and Klemperer traces in his diary the distortions of the language and the way in which the language itself had become at some level undermined or transformed through Nazi rule and Nazi power. Buber somehow wanted to maintain an awareness or a realization that somehow there was still a humanistic tradition that could be at some level returned to or revived. But that remains a question for all of us, particularly in living in a moment of crisis, as to whether the language, say, of democracy or the language of human rights is somehow adequate to the moment that we are living through and the crisis that we face in the context of European and global democracy. And the way that Buber remains a resource that we need and want to be able to live through. So I've been kind of inspired in this um, preparation to think about Buber's relationship to history. How does Buber relate to questions of historical narrative? And how does Buber see a certain relationship between Hegel's notion of a historical dialectic and what Heidegger is in fact doing. So I'm going to, um, I'm looking at this volume, which is called um, The Philosophy of Martin Buber, which is the Library of Living Philosophers, which is a wonderful collection of articles. And I've had this book for, I think, 40 years, but I've only just opened it and been able to read it with the same kind of real intensity. So I want to just draw upon a couple of discussions within this text that I think are helpful to this. So the first one I want to turn to is an article by Jakob Taubis, who was a philosopher, thinker, theologian, who wrote an essay in this collection called Buber and the Philosophy of History. And I just want to look at Buber's relationship or critique or challenge to certain conceptions of history. So Buber was both influenced by Marx and by Landauer and certain critiques of Marx that were shared by Landauer. And we're going to go and look at that next session. So I'm trying to say something that will be useful in preparing for some of the themes that we'll have in the session. And, and Buber learns in his critiques of um, Marx, but also in his appreciation of Landau from the work of Moses Hess. Moses Hess was a young Hegelian, and in the period of the young Hegelians, Buber recognizes that there's a fundamental shift in language which challenges a deep tradition within philosophy, within Western philosophy, 
that links back to questions of Plato and Descartes, that at some level, uh, the young Hegelians and, um, uh, and Moses Hess in particular, offers us a challenge um, that is part of his critique of, um, of both Hegel and of Heidegger. So Buber says, um, the shadow of Hegel also looms over German existentialism. For Hegel, and I'm now quoting from the Buber, for Hegel, world history is the absolute process in which the spirit attains the consciousness of itself. So for Heidegger, historical experience is the illumination of being itself. In neither is there room for a supra-historical reality that sees history and judges it. So both those traditions are in some way caught in a way that in which historical time becomes absolutized in ways that Buber really wants to be able to challenge. But it's significant um, that Buber's critique of the philosophy of history isn't a rejection of history, that rem but remains entangled in the realm of history. His, as Tauber says, his process against the judgment of history does not lead him to an escape from history, but to dissent in the midst of history against the actual course that Western history has taken. So in a moment of COVID and in a moment of threat that we've lived through, the question is, with what language and through what language do we engage with the questions that we are being challenged by? Buber's protest against the judgment of history is itself a different kind of engagement with history, an of active engagement and a critical engagement. So at one and the same time, Buber critiques Paul's history of salvation and Hegel's dialectic of reason. And he seeks a different kind of engagement in which space is created for the actions and moral responsibilities of individuals. So what remains striking in Buber is both a critique of liberal individualism, but a refusal to think that individuals are somehow disconnected um, from the histories that they're living through and an engagement with the way in which human beings remain active subjects. And Taubus is able to kind of um, frame that recognition through what uh, Buber learns from Hess. He learns um, both about the importance of different cultural histories and says that nations and cultures carry their own different modes of experience. So um, there isn't a unique or singular historical development. And he also learns from Hesse's critique of Christianity that seeks the salvation of the individual in the realm not of this world. In his stress on the messianism of the prophets and the rabbis that seek the perfection of human beings in the actual world of the social community. 
And this is something, an insight shared with Landauer and part of a critique that Buber frames of both um, Hegel and Heidegger, that in some way, a space has to be created which critiques a tradition of liberal individualism, but recognizes the social character and nature of individual individual and collective lives. So in living through a particular kind of critical moment in the present, we're trying to recognize the responsibilities that individuals have and carry as they engage critically with the historical moments that we are living through, but recognizing that the language or the discourses that we inherit, both within um, radical left traditions, but also in liberal traditions, might well have to be rethought if we are to engage with um, the radical challenges that we face in the present. Now, Buber recognizes the way that human beings are interrelated and live in relationships. And questions Heidegger's notion of individuals as self-sufficient I apologize for the phone call. I hope it, uh, you can't hear it. There's a moment that uh, Buber says the following, which I think is a really interesting thing to, and I'll kind of um, end on it, but I think it's an important uh, framing. Um, there's a moment when Buber says, in critique of Heidegger, the spirit is not the is not like the blood which flows in you, but it's like the air which you breathe. So we're already for Buber in relationship to nature, because last term we had uh, a discussion around, particularly in distance and relationship, how human beings are seen in relationship to nature we see how Buber is tied to a certain kind of tradition of human, um, of a humanist tradition, but not one which necessarily frames the human in separation from nature. But in this vision, particularly in this quote, you can see how when he says, we exist like the air in which we breathe already, already into, in an interrelationship, both with relationships, but, well, both, but also with nature. And that as human beings, we are challenged and questioned by relationships. And in the COVID crisis, what's become absolutely clear are the inequalities um, and different dangers the people from different racial, eth ethnic, and class backgrounds face in their possibilities of being able to work, and um, the, um, but also the the crisis that we face in relationship to um, the global uh, pandemic, but also an emerging crisis in relationship to the climate. So there were ways in which, in the critique of Heidegger, uh, and in the critique in the notion of um, being and beings coming into relationship with itself, um, Buber sees certain Christian legacies, Catholic legacies, individualized legacies within, um, within Heidegger's work, that mean that the human being is somehow separated uh, from the very world in which human beings need to be engaged um, 
and be ready to, to transformed. And this links back to where I started in terms of the both the learning but the critique that um, that uh, Buber makes of um, Kierkegaard. Uh, and I want to say this because I think there's some really interesting framing, but I won't go on too much with this. In Buber's early work in Ichundu, there's a way in which Buber and Kierkegaard are very close to each other. And Buber talks about um, how powerful, even to being overwhelming, is the saying of I by Jesus, for it is the I of unconditional relation. So there's a way that Buber is challenging Pauline Christianity or the way in which Christianity has been reimagined through its relationships with Rome and Roman imperial power and trying to recognize also um, in Christianity, but particularly in the Jewishness of Jesus, a different way of reading Christianity. So what remains a very powerful critique in uh, Buber's work, particularly in some of the later work, is using some of the Hasidic resources and the questions that are opened up to him about the importance of relationships in revisioning a notion of the relationship between Hebraic and Christian traditions, and particularly in his notion of Hebrew humanism, the way in which he frames certain Hasidic teachers as teachers. And he insists or questions the way in which within Jewish tradition, the notion of the Torah is seen as instruction and as teaching in its root term, but within Pauline tradition becomes framed as law. And um, Buber, in a kind of still incredibly relevant way, is helping us rethink um, that whole Christological tradition and opening a space for a very different revisioned relationship between Judaism and Christianity, but also in the relationship to everyday life and relationship. And in doing that, part of his challenge is a critique to a certain tradition of asceticism that he identifies in uh, Kierkegaard's work. And his polemic against Kierkegaard becomes stronger in later time. And I'm going to end with this. Is everybody following me? Is, is this, am I going in a way that is within, uh, I'm not trying, you know, people can be with me in dialogue. Um, Kierkegaard writes about how he wants or needs to give up his relationship with Regina Olsen in order to follow a real spiritual path. And Buber says, and I'll quote from Buber, this is ultimately to misunderstand God. Creation is not a hurdle on the road to God. It is the road itself. We are created along with one another and directed to a life with one another. A God reached by excluding all of God's creatures would not be the God of all lives in whom all life is fulfilled. So there's the notion of creation and fulfillment. And there's a, a wonderful text critical text by a theologian called Catherine Keller, I don't know how familiar, who writes a book called, which challenges the dominant notion of um, creation out of nothing, creator ex nihilo, uh, 
from the Greek Roman tradition, which imagines creation almost as apocalyptic terms, apocalyptic terms, as a sudden break. And that break is there as a kind of dangerous tendency of thinking that the world can suddenly be revolutionary transformed without understanding the processes that individuals in their inner lives need to go through in their own transformations. That's part of the communitarian reading of Marx that Buber takes on. It's what he learns from and learns with Landauer, that you need a space for individual individuals to transform and change themselves. So he says in Kierkegaard, in some way that reflects this discussion, God wants us to come to him by means of all the reginas he has created and not by renunciation of them, that the relationship of love and intimacy is not something to be sacrificed in a ethic of self-renunciation, but a Hebraic ethic of Hebrew humanism um, talks about the importance of creation, but not creation out of nothing. So there's a different reading, there's a different reading, um, there's a different reading of the very nature of creation. So the, there is a material world that is created in the stories of Genesis, but there isn't a radical break of a creation from nothing. And that's the way that Buber recognizes that we're always in our relationships in a process of change and transformation. And that for Buber, the notion of education and learning isn't something that can simply be transformed or transferred from one person to another. But Buber's focus, as we did last term, on the notion of education and the notion of the education of character is in this recognition that people, we have to make those learnings ourselves in our own relationships. I'll finish there. I'm just gonna... I'm just going to turn this phone off. Hi. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Vic. Um, about how how the present moment can disturb or characterize or start to leave traces in our language and what that means for how we relate. Very rich uh, introduction. Um, shall we, um, maybe sh should we take five minute uh, break or so for people to gather their thoughts and then we can uh, maybe have a discussion on the basis of it. Would that be a good idea? Yeah. Shall we just do that for, for five minutes and then, um, so it's now 1641, so 1646, when you can leave it on, but then we, uh, we start the discussion. Ah, oh, yes, we should look at the... Uh, uh, Fake that that quote about um, uh, the 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 hut and the castle. Where where is that from? Um, it's quoted in the um, in by Fiedler in an article on um, on Buber and psychoanalysis in this in the Living Philosophy book. Ah, okay, yeah. And 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 the one about uh, needing all of God's uh, re Regines. Uh, that's also from that text, but that's a uh, the essay by Jean Wall. Mm 
Ah, oh, that's nice. John Wilde. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely collection, that book. So many. I didn't realize how rich it was. It really is. It's also a funny article there by Hartshorn, which... Uh, you know, there's some strange work there, but there's some also very good quality work, which I hadn't realized. And Taubus must have been a kind of colleague at some level. He must have known Boober quite well, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to take a minute break. Yeah. I'll get the reference. Okay, let's, um, I think um, most people will be back. Yeah, so, okay, can, can we, um, yeah, let's, let's uh, discuss uh, the, the contribution. Can I ask someone to, who has a question or a comment, would like to start the discussion? I will try to keep track of people raising their hands, if you can use the... You can either use the make it make it make a, a sign or um, or type something in the chat or you can just raise your hand. I'll try to keep an eye on it or just unmute yourself. Yeah, Anastasia. First Anastasia, then Marcus. Thanks very much, Vic, for that really compelling account. Um, really fascinating, and um, I have a lot of questions, but I just wanted to focus on the existential condition uh, in relation to ethnicity, relocation, homeland, 
and Buber's thought. Can you just unpack a little bit for me that relationship that I just wanted a little bit further to push you to, to develop? Can you give me the core links philosophically? What are some of the questions that we should be addressing in the post-return homeland relocation and the existential human condition? Well, I think there's a certain tension between um, a kind of abstracted notion of the individual as rational self that can move between any spaces, which is there in a kind of Kantian ethical tradition, that we exist as rational moral selves that discern a moral law, and that, in some ways, the, one of the strongest traditions within kind of European modernity that is shaped around a notion of human, human white European superiority in its framing. And it's, but it's been incredibly powerful. And it also shapes, in important senses, notions of equality and freedom that transcend notions of gender and race. And, um, but that tradition has shaped European colonial histories in quite marked ways because it's marked the notion that Europe presents a future to those countries that it can colonize or occupy and that only through subordination to U European colonial power can indigenous peoples make a transition from nature to culture, from tradition to modernity. And this is something that I've shaped in work that I've done. In, I did a book called Unreasonable Men, which talk, talks about masculinity and social theory, about the particular way in which this is a masculine ethos within a kind of Kantian tradition. And there's a, I think there's a certain way that Buber is both caught within that tradition, and some of the positive strengths of it, um, but also partly through Hess, Moses Hess, but also partly through the influence of Herder, and Herder's challenge to the notion of a, a, a universal European notion of modernity. Um, Herder, who was a really significant thinker in this, if I just you know, go on on this, um, frames the way that um, take the German court. Germany at the time was dominated by a superior French court. And the idea was that it made no difference if you spoke French because French was the universal language, which you could say that in terms of English, you know, it becomes a universal language. And Herder says, no, it might be universal, and, but there will be certain things that you can't express and you can't understand unless you can speak in your own German, in your own language in some way. And that those lang and language in that way carries a certain history and carries a certain cultural tradition that that language brings into a notion of humanity which is developed through particular a conversation between different cultural and historical traditions. And Buber inherits that partly through Head and then partly through Moses Hess and partly through Hess's critique of a certain kind of orthodox Marxist tradition which tends to frame itself within a kind of universal future salvation. So that's why I was marking the influence of Hess, because that will make it easier for us to think about uh, Buber's relationship to Landa, but also that it has very deep philosophical um, notions that in order to become a human being, you have to transcend differences of class, gender, race. And that goes way back to Pauline Christianity. The notion that to be a human being means in some way to transcend differences and to recognize that underneath we're all the same. So <clears throat> that frames these really interesting and important uh, 
discussions. And Buber is inheriting a tradition, partly through his own teachers, Dilti and Zimmel and Shela, where these different traditions are in conversation with each other. But that, and that conversation is very relevant to us today. I mean, I think it marks certain aspects, both of, of Buber Zionism, but also he is questioning of political notions of Zionism and the importance of develop, de, de, developing dialogue um, and shared space with, Palest with Palestinians and, and Jews. So I think it has quite a, a kind of deep legacy that we are in some way kind of challenging. And it tends to frame, particularly in the kind of Kantian tradition, the notion that human beings are radically divided between our reason, which is an independent faculty, and our natures. And that we need to rule our natures through our independent faculty of reason. And that basically means that we shape very disembodied notions of knowledge. Uh, and I think part of the strength that I'm learning from Buber and that B Buber learns from Hasidic tradition is a way in which ethics becomes an embodied tradition. We learn out of everyday experience and our relationships with others. We can't simply be taught, as you can within a Christian catechism, certain principles, because in order for our learning to take place, this is something we have to be able to do for ourselves. Nobody can do it for us. And that's the space that Buva makes for individual change and transformation. So there's a certain critique of an orthodox Marxist thing which sees Marxist revolution as emerging out of contradictions within the economy, but doesn't involve a transformation of political consciousness. And Buba sense with Landauer um, of the importance of people taking responsibility for for the way in which both we live, but also the way in which our consciousness will be a constant response to particular historical moments. And we're living in the last week through this very dramatic historical moment, both in terms of COVID, which is transforming our everyday lives and relationships, and what happened in Washington. But what is the moral language? Do we have a moral language? which is adequate to that situation? And does Buber's language help us, or how does it help us? And how do we have to think both with Buber, but develop Buber's ideas in order to be able to engage with these, these very different contexts that he couldn't have anticipated? So that's why I brought about the notion of fragmented, fractured language, the idea that you get much more in Celan than you do in Buber, really, about the brokenness of language or the inability to express or the need for a new term. Like if you take a notion like sexual abuse or gender, you know, sexual violence, this is a language that isn't simply thinkable within an either framework. It offers us, in some way, a richer language to understand the workings of gender relations of power. We can't simply transcend those relationships because we're all in them. And in our everyday relationships, and we might be 20 or we might be 80, we're still encountering and engaging in those relationships. And Buber's focus on the way that we engage in those relationships is really important we are engaging with them in the everyday but he doesn't necessarily have a sense of the gendered dynamics or the sexual dynamics of those relationships which are also into integral to our sense of becoming human or ethical humans sorry if i went too long on that but that's no, that was great. That's, that I really wanted to hear the connection with how ethics is an embodied, experiential, and emotional 
kind of journey and that really helped me make that connection. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think Boob was reaching for that at different stages, but there's a certain kind of universalism in his uh, framing that sometimes makes it difficult. And the way that the both the Hasidic tradition but also the speaking of I. And I think in Paul's book, Paul's recognized that um, the Buba does speak in an I term, but not that, not very often in terms of his own personal experience. And even in this quite big book about his work, he returns to the same couple of moments that he shares mm -hmm. as formative personal experiences. Um, but what does it mean to speak personally? And how do we understand the relationship between the personal and the political or the personal and the philosophical? And to what extent, and Derrida was doing this right at the end, he was saying, why was it that in the Western philosophical tradition, we never speak in terms of I? What's become, what, what was it in Greek tradition that disavowed the I or made the I very difficult to say. And in the in the quote that I made, you know, in uh, where he's talking about Kierkegaard and the notion of Jesus saying I, that's a really important moment of the capacity to say I. But often when we say I, and we're 10 years old, and we talk about love, when we're 25 or 35 or 55, we use the same I love, but it has a very different meaning and a very different content because that concept isn't just an abstracted concept. It's a concept that has been reshaped or given a different shape through our lived experience. And it will be a matter of coming to terms with that experience. And Buber helps us in how we come to terms with that experience. But there are certain aspects of that experience that he tends to abstract from okay. in terms of our present understandings. Thanks, um, uh, Vic. Anastasia, is that, uh, does that address, begin to address some of the issues? Uh, the, the Marcus had a, had a point as well, and then uh, Emily. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vic. That was very, very interesting and very engaging. Um, I think I may be endangering myself and everyone by dragging this discussion into more into the present than into the philosophical aspects. But I just wanted to say that the, the, when you start at the beginning and you compared Buber with Celan and how Buber had managed to return to dialogue, whereas Celan hadn't, I came across an interesting paragraph by David Novak, basically explaining that as a European philosopher, one whose philosophy and their, had theretofore been expressed in masterful German prose, his spiritual journey to Jerusalem, however, did involve a profound re-examination of those German philosophers whose problematic he understood to be his own as well, and whose intellectual equal he no doubt felt himself to be. Now, I, basically, Buber came out of this with Hebrew, his attitude to Hebrew humanism and his attitude to dialogue, whereas the German philosophers, some of them certainly, adopted uh, national socialism. But really, what I, I wanted to basically ask was, you mentioned at the very beginning the situation we find ourselves in today with COVID and with what happened in the US last week. And one of the problems is there really is no dialogue between the different sides. Mm. I mean, each one, e even that video you mentioned uh, of... Um, uh, uh, Schwarzenegger. Yeah, Schwarzenegger. Basically, it was a, a tirade against the other side. And, yeah. and er everything we hear today and every one of these videos is trying to show how the other side is wrong and we're correct. And, and we, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to solve anything in that way. All that we will solve is whoever is more powerful at the time will be dominant. Um, and, and this whole thing which, which Buber has achieved is the, the, to, in, in, in return for the kind of situation we find ourselves in today, he basically was, was promoting dialogue 
The same way he was doing with the Arab uh, Palestinian Jewish problem in Israel. Um, how do we move from where we are today mm -hmm. to, to getting that kind of data? And can we do it without changing the whole concept of education as it exists today? Because really, if, if without some kind of educational basis to question and to understand ourselves and others, uh, we, we, we can't even get involved in the, in the process of dialogue. I mean, one of the things that you said at the end of your last explanation was the issue. I mean, one of the things we haven't mentioned is the issue of trust and kind of di Buber's dialogue is based on trust, both on self-trust, understanding our own ourselves and, and where our, our problems, our, ch our challenges come from, and then trusting the other who we are having the dialogue with, this kind of mutual trust, which again doesn't happen very often, but it certainly requires. So, I, I mean, I don't want to drag the, the discussion into what next week's topic, but because I think that the, the missing dialogue missing element of dialogue is what's so, so wrong with the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, no, I'm, sure that's right. I'm sure that's right. Um, and, and I share your um, disquiet, but I think there's also a line to be drawn, presumably, between the awareness that se over 70 million people voted for uh, Trump, and um, so that what does it mean for a political society to be so polarized over so many years, and what is the nature of dialogue across those differences? And I, I mean, I wrote a book on 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 um, Brexit in Britain, exactly uh, to open up a dialogue and a recognition on the part of Remainers in Britain about what the conditions and sources of inequality and injustice that people who were voting um, for Brexit were coming out of after years of austerity and a global financial crisis in which it was often working class people in Britain who were being able, being obliged to pay the price for a global financial crisis they didn't create. So, and I wrote that book exactly in order to frame the possibilities of dialogue on both sides. So you don't then just treat um, in the way that a liberal culture can, as the other side is just being stupid or ignorant. You know that, and that becomes a generational discourse. Of they're just stupid and ignorant. They don't know. And that's why they voted for it. So there is a certain sense of superiority that then comes, uh, and no acknowledgement of whatever the strengths of certain of the critiques of globalization that happened in the U.S. or the impact of globalization. So I share that with you, but I also think there's an important line. Is, uh, how do we understand it, between notions of insurgency or the, the lies or the claims towards a coup that um, were being organized in some way over quite a long time by Trump in his refusal to accept that el the election vote. So there's a way that you want to be able to affirm the truth of what happened in the election in the US, at the same time, open up spaces for dialogue. And you've got to be able to do both. And that's probably why we need a, a different kind of relationship between morality and politics. We need to both be able to draw a clear line of what happened on the Capitol building, to realize the way it was provoked very clearly by Trump and his family and others in that morning. You know. um, but we then have to think in different ways about the nature of dialogue. And, and the notion of trust, when trust gets broken down in a social space, um, is really, you know, it's important to think about what it means to live in a polarized society and how that society is polarized and whether that language of polarization is adequate and what our traditions are in. I mean, I'm also a sociologist, so I, I'm kind of, I draw on, um, you know, sociologists and traditions of social 
theory in order to think about what or how these how societies have become uh, polarized. And Buber is certainly right in terms of you need to be able to engage or trust with yourself in order for you to be able to trust others. That's a completely vital insight that that Buba has about the relationship of trust. But also then, what does it mean to develop a relationship with yourself? And how do our practices of teaching and learning have to be radically revisioned in order that people both learn to trust themselves and their own opinions and views? And it's not simply a matter of rote learning. In the UK, our education system has been undermined for 20 years now, where education has become a matter of testing and exams and it's only through the covid crisis somehow and the inequalities of technology that have been exposed in the covid crisis that deeper questions are being raised in britain about well what is schooling about it's not just about exam qualifications it's about learning but what does it mean to learn and how do i learn in this and and what's the language in which um our experience of COVID can be um, kind of acknowledged. I just want to read this bit out, okay? Um, I wanted to say it in my thing, but I didn't. This is something that was sent to me on uh, as an email of somebody's response to writing about um, COVID, the experience of COVID. And it's by Kate Clanshee. Okay, can everybody hear it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know I'd miss waiting at traffic lights, waiting for a burst of color, a static of sound. I didn't know I'd miss noise, crowds, the breath of rain as it hits parched tarmac being near enough to hear people's breath. I didn't realize I was only exactly alone when I was walking home from school or to the shops. I didn't realize it was the in-between times that held me together. So when I read that, someone sent that out to Blue and I thought, that's a booba. Mm -hmm. recognition of being together, the in-between times and the in-between spaces that help me together. And there's something about in-between times where people from different communities come together in unfamiliar spaces, say the space of a hospital, in which people from very different eth ethnic class or racial backgrounds in the glory of the NHS discover themselves being cared for by nurses from very different cultural and class backgrounds. So there's something about our National Health Service in Britain, I think anyway, compared to insurance-based, where there is a different sense of people trusting others to look after them in moments of real need where questions of income and money don't operate in the same kind of way and there's a different recognition of health or what the meaning of health is that suddenly we're all being confronted with and the crisis is creating a space between us, like we are meeting in this space, that's both unfamiliar but not unintimate. And over the time as we see each other, we're beginning to trust to say things that we might not have said last term or take risks in what we might say with each other that we might have more easily done if we were sitting in the same room um, and we might be obliged to do if we're sitting in the same hospital ward. But the notion of vulnerability also, here's another notion which I think 
the notion of vulnerability, which is there in Buber in many ways, many different ways, but the notion of how we're vulnerable because of COVID and how to think with Buber about COVID as one of the things that people could be writing or you know, some people get together to think about and the trust that we have or don't have in different moments or different situations, I think is a really uh, important to reflect that we might, we are always in some way developing a different kind of language. And I thou is a very important starting point, but we can also be fixed by it. It can be too generalized uh, and it needs to be, it needs to grow and develop and breathe in a different kind of way. Thanks. Thanks, Vic. Marcus. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we, we may want to keep in mind this point about uh, morality. This, so you seem to be saying the di dialogue uh, is a, has to be has to evolve how you have to look at it as a moral language and where where do we get the sources of our morality where are they today um and it seems to me that the experience of disembodiment that you also mentioned that that may have something to do with this polarization that we experience or that the experience of disembodiment brings out the polarization in a more stark way and so these but before we go there let me let me just because we have some other uh, people who want to 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 say something. Emily, and uh, and Peter, you have a comment in the in the, in the box, but maybe you can, um, you can voice that. But Emily, please go first. Yes, thank you. I this is something that intrigued me when I read that for Heidegger, it, he says that um, man cannot stand before himself, and says, and this is the way he justifies this notion of nothing. And it seems to me uh, that, you know, I mean, why can we not stand before us? We have con the consciousness of ourselves and we have thinking, uh, you know. Uh, so I don't know how he gets this notion, please. Thank you. The notion of, just say a bit more, Em, about the notion, where, where, where are you feeling trouble? What's the source of? Well, he says that, um, yeah, uh, for, um, when, when Kierkegaard speaks about anxiety and dread uh, and, uh, yeah, and man standing alone before God, so man feels anxiety and dread, and Heidegger as man stands before, before himself and nothing else. And then there's a contradiction because... Um, it, it, it says that, you know, Heidegger thinks that we cannot stand before ourselves, you know? Therefore, he justifies this question of uh, nothing because we cannot stand before ourselves, but we can stand before ourselves because we can think and we have self-awareness. Yes, that's it, you know? Gross. 204, page 204. Yeah. Are you in 204? Yeah. Yeah. At the end, towards the end. With Kierkegaard, man's anxiety and dread become essential as anxiety about the relation with God and dread, lest he miss it. Yeah. With Heidegger, they become essential as anxiety about the growth of self-being and dread, lest it be missed. In his anxiety and dread, Kierkegaard's man stands alone before God. Yeah. Heidegger's man stands before himself and nothing else. And since in the last resort one cannot stand before oneself, he stands in his anxiety and dread before nothing. Yeah. yeah? Yes. So, so in that in that context, Emily, he's agreeing with you. Because he's saying, um, or Buber's agreeing with you that you can't, that Heidegger can't stand um, on his own before himself in that way. When um, we all can, no? Yeah, I think, well, I think yeah, we can, but I think it's can. a translation of before nothing, and dread before nothing. 
But I think the uh, the it, this is really interesting because it also links to what. So if you just go a bit further, in order to become a single one and to enter into the single one's relation with the absolute, so it's interesting what the single one or the notion of singleness. Um, Kierkegaard's man or it has to renounce his essential relation to another as Kierkegaard himself renounces the essential relationship to another, to his fiance, a renunciation which shapes the great theme of his work and journals. Kierkegaard, Heidegger's man has no essential relationship to renounce. Yeah. In, in, so in Kierkegaard's world, there is a vow spoken with the very being to the other person. Mm -hmm even if that other person is to be uh, renounced. So it's also about the place of love and relationship as part of creation that Buber's, Buber's uh, Hasidic-based um, Hebrew humanism wants to acknowledge the importance of love and relationship so that you're never standing alone, uh, you're always standing with, and you're always in relationship to God in in uh, Buber's terms. Yeah, but not not with Heidegger. But not with Heidegger. So there's a kind of individualized frame um, of in which Heidegger um, isn't in relation. So it isn't there isn't a relationship to renounce. There's a relationship with oneself in that. What? Can, I, can I add something? It, it, it is a, it is an, an, an interesting question because um, the whole the whole this I, I reread this bit as well for today and and I was sort of I I was sort of struck by how much energy there is in it. It's actually, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, um, better than at times before when I read it, and I was wondering if that had something to do with the contemporary moment. But um, of course, Heidegger does say that. Um, the whole the whole thing about Dasein, about this 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 I or this 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 being that um, that this, uh, being and time speaks about, is that it is the being that is a question for itself or that has a relationship to itself. That is the whole defining point. And yet, um, Buber here seems to say, well, you cannot stand before yourself in the end. So, um, is that the background well, of the question, Emily? So, how does that work? What's going on there? Yeah, we can stand before ourselves because we have a self consciousness and we, we think we can even stand before the nothingness and we can experience nothingness. So, I mean, you know, but yeah. in, in some way, Buber is questioning that we or that we're always questioned by. So even if we're standing before ourselves in nothingness, for Buber, there's a sense that we're always being questioned by whatever is going on in the world or in our relationship with God, where we're always being constantly questioned. What What's also in the background to this is Buber's recognition of how important his first reading of Fear and Trembling was I remember it's such an, a significant text in that it talks about how anxiety is a whole shaping of experience. So it's not just your beliefs or your reasoning. It opens up a language, a kind of existential language about being gripped by fear, as we might be in the COVID. You know, I can't go out of my house without feeling that everybody I meet is a potential danger. danger so that my space, even my street, mm -hmm. even the front door yeah. assumed a different uh, meaning. It's a different significance. And um, there's something in that Kierkegaard, that notion of anxiety as a kind of lived experience which goes beyond reasoning at some level that both Heidegger and Buber kind of learn from but there's something still there in the Kierkegaard 
that is difficult to capture. You know, there's something about the gripped by fear as an existential condition that psychotherapy might work with over a period of years with someone. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's not a momentary mm. uh, standing by, it's, by, it's being gripped by a traumatic memory or a, a second generation memory that um, leaves you in fear or distrust in ways that you might not or ever kind of recognize. I've been thinking about that in terms of my own history where my mother came from Vienna and carried this history of how her life had been transformed over a weekend. No, over a weekend when the Nazis moved into Vienna, her life just changed and she was threatened and she had to, and then I was thinking about here, in, how that how that was passed on transgenerationally that sense of uh, life can change so quickly at any moment you know? um, and be transformed violently at any moment and how at some level I still carry that even though you know I've embodied it but I've embodied it in ways that I don't even know and even through decades of psychotherapy I'm still touching some of that experience i mean i can't even the psychotherapy couldn't necessarily make me aware of the extent to which that sense of suddenness you know or the sense of jewish as a dangerous identity that could get you shot or something how you carry that so i'm interested in how the history is that's why i was trying to think about history that it will can take you a lifetime to come to terms with histories of migration or displacement, even though you've learned to live in one culture or one society and made it your own, and those histories have become your own. But how do we experience or think morally about uh, experiences of displacement or forced migration? Mm -hmm. What are the terms? I think it's an interesting conversation opening up between me and Johan in this, in terms of, I think we have different senses of how to think of morality. So I tend to think of morality as kind of everyday practice, but morality is always there. It isn't a question of rules or principles. Yeah. Um, but often we're unaware of how we are responding. So the notion of a historical break or a traumatic his history and how that gets passed on to the next generation um, that affects morality but in ways that might be difficult to voice and articulate and I think it's interesting both um, what Buber learns from Kierkegaard but also certain aspects of Kierkegaard's kind of fracturing of life um, that are difficult in Buber's language to articulate. Okay, uh, so so yes, thanks very much. I mean, these are, this again. Here are so many things that we that we can um, and, we, and we have to sort of look into in more detail. I think uh, just just to to close this this thing off about standing before yourself. Uh, I think in this chapter, Buber starts by saying. Um, uh, Heidegger is not philosophical anthropology because he doesn't talk about concrete, real people. He talks about something much more abstract. And um, Vic, as you've already said, there is also this sort of pen bending towards the abstract in Buber's own language. Um, but, but I think um, that quote that Emily highlighted could be seen in that context. We cannot, as concrete human beings, stand before ourselves. We, we always stand before someone else. Um, but at an abstract level, the human being is, as Heidegger says, the, the being who is problematic for himself or for herself. And I think it is there, there is this, this thing about abstract and concrete that plays a role there as well. In the in the word that is spoken, uh, which I just put up here, um, which is, of course, after the war, and we, we also said as a question in the beginning, what is the disruption, the fragmentation that the Shoah has has meant for Buber, and where do we find those traces? But he here he in this word that is spoken, 
you set a lecture in the context of Heidegger, broadly speaking, we get the same point that um, uh, you don't speak a word to yourself for 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 Buber. You speak a word to to another uh, when you think. Um, you, there is a level of thinking that precedes the word. Maybe that is the infant. Um, but that's a very relational state. And here he seems to present it as somehow not, not as relational. So there's a lot there to say, but I wanted to now go to Peter because there's a, a big discussion in the, in the chat going on. Peter, could you, uh, could you uh, 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 repeat your point? I'll do my best. I don't know if this is particularly well articulated, but I was thinking in response to the exchange earlier between, I think, Marcus and Vic, uh, bringing some of the discussion back to the present moment, um, and in particular, polarization in society and uh, the events in the capital here in the States uh, last week. And, and so one of, the, one of the topics that I've done some work on in the past and, and teach a seminar on is loyalty. And I'm, so I'm sort of interested in this question of, even before we reach the level of policy or disagreements on particular issues, how we think of our relation to our, to, to our broader political society. And, and as I've been thinking through these questions of, of polarization, uh, and also again, just the last few days in the wake of what's been going on in Washington, I, I've been trying to myself to articulate some distinctions among helpful and less helpful attitudes uh, towards uh, towards our fellow citizens or the members of, of our of our society and so the way I put it in the chat there is that it seems to me that and I don't know if this is philosophical or even in some ways just temperamental but but some of us probably tend a little more towards a kind of underlying attitude of gratitude towards society for the various blessings uh, that it brings us um, uh, material and otherwise right uh, whereas others, I think, tend a little more towards a critical attitude of, of righteous indignation at the shortcomings and injustices of society. I think any healthy political dialogue needs sort of both of those perspectives uh, in conversation with each other. And each has a sort of um, evil twin. Right? Uh, gratitude can turn into a kind of complacency and ignoring uh, of injustice. Uh, righteous indignation can turn into a kind of hatred or, or simple rejection of society and one's fellows. And I don't know that there's much possibility for dialogue between the complacent and the, uh, the hatred poles, uh, but there probably is between the gratitude and the righteous indignation. And so there's, I have this, this question as to how we sort of maintain over time um, an appropriate spectrum of underlying orientations that still sort of fall within the range of dialogue without tipping into those uh, those ends, and, and there were a number of comments there that tied that in particularly to social media and some contemporary forms of communication. But that, that's what I was sort of puzzling over myself in the, in the comments. Can I just say something in relation to that, which I think is really helpful, Peter? Yeah. Um, it's interesting where the cons, I like what you're saying both about gratitude and righteous indignation. But I'm wondering where those concepts come from and whether or not before you move towards them, there needs to be a process of listening. And that listening might be, even though you, you talked about loyalty, but if you take a notion of patriotism and you hear interviews of people who were part of the insurrection, they were doing it in their own minds as patriots. That's what they thought they were, and they were defending a constitution. That's how they thought. So, the, so is there a way that Buber helps us first, before you make these categorical distinctions, to listen to what the people are themselves saying before you move into the interesting conceptual work. See what I mean? So that there's more to be done in uh, listening to Trump supporters, which has been happening. I and mean, there's some very good work over the last so many years um, in people who've attempted to kind of listen and make sense of. I know there are limits to that, but I just thought that 
that needs to be a starting point, even in this very difficult situation. Because otherwise you get a dialectic of concepts of gratitude and um, righteous indignation, and then you want to either put them into a dialogue, a dialogue with each other or bring a certain kind of um, moment. But there's also a way that understanding the righteous in indignation doesn't just reflect a lack of gratitude, but that righteous indignation comes out of a particularly material history over the last 10 or 15 years of austerity and a changing American economy. That also has to be engaged with. Mm. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe maybe Katrina's comment fit, fits in here around... Um... Because we're moving so from from the concepts into the, ma the materiality of the relations that we are having and how they are affected by the media that we use. But would that be a good point for you, Katrina, to to raise that uh, that, that that point here? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, we're all still reeling from everything, and it's really interesting to try and connect it to the ways in which our communications have been impacted by going online um, since the pandemic. Because I think now, certainly where we are in Ireland, we're in a very intense third wave and a strict lockdown. And I think what you see now, because we've all been in the online thing since last March, but now there's the, the, the kind of resources for communication, which could still just about make their way through uh, the virtual when they were when when there was still <laughs> some kind of reserve and i think those reserves are now empty or dwindling fast and and that makes it much harder so i i think there's no coincidence that this happens now um sorry it's not very I'm, I'm thinking of other particular things that have happened communications wise where now one is at the point where one's personal relationships now for almost a year have had to be mediated in this way and they start to take a toll and without becoming overly personal, it just it's um, I've noticed there's an uptick in anxiety around friendship circles as well, because they, they just haven't been fed. They haven't been nourished. That interpersonal embodied space has now been completely deprived for, for quite some time. And it's looking like that won't change anytime soon, certainly not here. So once that oxygen supply is cut off and then we're fully in the virtual and plus the kind of underlying anxiety it becomes a very big task to try and to try and re-establish. I really liked what you said um, about this, you know, maintaining an appropriate spectrum of orientation, um, Peter, that really resonated with me because I think it becomes more embattled now. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's, I mean, what would you say about the thought that dialogue in Boober can can appear some some somewhat disembodied, but if anything, the experience that we have now is that this disembodiment, disembodied world in which we are living, that that becomes the problem for dialogue. And so we, we it's almost as if this is the, the learning that we get from this situation is that dialogue is essentially embodied. Which brings us back to, to his reflections. What's helpful there are the things about the the spokenness of the word and you mean then what we were talking about in the first semester about phon the phonetic event of yeah precisely yeah 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 that seems to me uh, yeah okay so and, and it, it could be that we are that we are experiencing in a radical way the insufficiency of the media that we now have to use but that seems to chime with what michael benedict was putting into the chat as well yeah precisely yeah michael but michael you were making a point about that would you care to comment on that? And then Daniel, please, because you also made a point that has to do with this. Um, well, it's just that, um, you know, when you, when you speak through a tube or look through a little circle, uh, you have to shout louder to be heard. Uh, you have to say more extreme things to get it. It, it does become an arms race. Um, it's very similar to, you know, if you have an audience that's seated and someone stands up, everyone has to stand up in order to see past the person, the other person that's standing up. Um, you know, if you drive a car and then people start buying SUVs, you have to buy an SUV so that you can see past the other SUVs. So there's a, 
you know, if everyone goes home at five o'clock, the streets are clogged with cars. There's a kind of a, an effect here where the medium uh, forces, forces extreme views. Um, and I think that's probably what, what happened to a great extent with Facebook and, uh, and Twitter. It's certainly how Trump used Twitter. And the only way to respond in 17 words or whatever the limit was uh, is to be extremely extreme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that is anti-dialogical. Because in true dialogue, there's all kinds of silence. And I think you've even noticed when, when you're Zooming with one other person, especially someone that you are familiar with, you can let seconds go by where neither of you speak, uh, which is much closer to physical presence with someone. When you're physically present with someone, you, you don't speak all the time. You look out the window, you make tea, you fuss with things. Um, you know, there's, there's a time and a rhythm that is um, hard to maintain on Zoom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So th and th that begins to, to tell us something around the importance of, of this mediatedness and how we think about the mediatedness in order, yeah. may, even as a moral category almost in terms of uh, Vic, what, you're, what you were saying. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I think, sorry. I think what, you're, what we're doing here with what 20, 20 of us is difficult yeah. uh, because getting 20 people to relate at an I thou level is not, not probably not possible actually. But on our side is the fact that, you, you know, uh, you guys have given it a lot of time. We spend uh, two hours and a lot of it is fairly meandering. And a lot of us are quiet. Um, and there's a kind of a relaxedness about it that I, I really enjoy. Mm. It does give me time to think and feel, feel for you guys. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. I feel, I feel that way too. Um, uh, uh, I'm going, Daniel, you had a comment about Schwarzenegger, which might be illustrative here. And then um, uh, Jordan has raised his hand and then maybe Vic, you can respond to. Well, I'd that. like to get to Schwarzenegger by going back to Buben Heidegger. And for me, and I imagine for others still, that question of Heidegger's membership of the Nazi party, which he doesn't seem to have apologized for, really dealt with. Um, and I. I think Bube himself said he didn't really have a dialogue with Heidegger, but they had a philosophical discussion. But there was something which made it impossible to have a proper dialogue with Heidegger, I think, um, that he, he had joined something, he never apologized for it, he was part of it, even though he may have claimed he was trying to mitigate it or, 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 or make it, well. And this similarly, I think Schwarzenegger in his own style was challenging fellow Republicans who hadn't um, who hadn't done their own challenging of Trump early enough and allowed something to to grow. So I think there is a question of truth at present, which arises out of all of that. And in the uh, word that is spoken, I think Buber was saying that truth is to do with faithfulness to the reality out there and faithfulness to the other you're speaking to and faithfulness to oneself, to one's uh, perhaps uh, own authenticity. Uh, and I think all of that seems a little bit to be breaking down at the moment. Um, and I share with Vic one final thought about uh, my own family background. My parents came in 39 from Czechoslovakia, also having a sense that civilization was a, quite a thin veneer, even though you were in a deeply cultured society could so easily switch change. Uh, and I think that's partly the feeling I've been left with since last week that, you know, how easily people are manipulated, led, um, and, and believe absurd conspiracy the theories which can end in disaster. So I, I think it's a, a moment to consider that and to compare it to what I think Schwarzenegger was not being overly dramatic in comparing his own childhood experience. No what was happening in America. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, would you like to come in and then maybe Vic, you can respond to it? Thank you. Um, 
I just wanted to um, add a slight um, comment to what um, Michael was um, sharing. And um, it seems to, to me that in, in this age of social media and technology, um, the rapidity, um, I guess, through which we're living life today um, does not appear to permit us to have those moments of pause or you can say silenced uh, um, reflection or contemplation prior to judgment. So um, in other words, it, it, with, the, with social media at our fingertips, um, we get our, our, our news sources almost instantaneously. And I think the, um, the space between an actual event happening and then um, a reasoned uh, judgment of that event is becoming um, more, uh, rather there's less and less space in between those two poles. So that was simply just 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 an observation inspired by what um, Michael was sharing with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th thanks very much for that. And and uh, and in that context, Peter asks if dialogue is uh, yeah, if, if there's something something more to to it to the problem of around dialogue and disembodiment because the book is also disembodied. And maybe that rapidity that you mentioned is something to do with it. I'm not sure. Uh, or the lack of a common ground, as Artemis suggests. Um, fake. This is a lot to respond to, but um, yeah, what? I think that I think what uh, was just said was really important. What Jordan said that the the lack of common ground, or what what we understand by common ground now, um, in a situation where we're so separated from each other, in the way that Michael and Katrin was saying about. The, the workings of new, of the technologies that do separate us and shape the form in which we can communicate. And I was thinking about exhaustion, you know, the, the kind of energetic exhaustion as to how long this is taking and the inadequacy really of notions of resilience that have been so part of the kind of national framing that you have to be resilient and how we understand resilience in Buber's language. What, what does it mean to have resilience and what are the limits of it and to what extent um, do we have to close off aspects of ourselves and trust in ourselves in order to be resilient with others? Um, but also kind of energetic conceptions um, of the way that our energies are exhausted through time. So as I was trying to talk about like time, history and ethics, but something about the energy of exhaustion where even now um, the notion of the vaccine as somehow being the end of the tunnel is giving a certain kind of temporality, uh, which might turn out to be quite unrealistic in terms of what we might have to be living through. And then how do we engage our exhaustion and say, look, I really am exhausted. I'm feeling really tired. Um, and how do we understand that exhaustion as an embodied feature that means that, that even our friendships are being attenuated? So. Um, how do we rely on people within these new technologies? Even in this group, it would it would have been different if we were together in a room. Something else would be taking place in how we were feeling with each other. I think, uh, Mike, do you want to say something now? Just to come in on it. Sorry, took a second to unmute. Um, I can uh, just in terms of COVID, uh, I, I was vaccinated on Friday, um, and I was expecting uh, to feel uh, great relief. Uh, in fact, I did not feel great relief. I felt minor relief uh, because I still have to wear a mask everywhere. 
I had I had dreams of being able to uh, walk around liberated because of, of being impregnable now. Um, yeah. That my masklessness would be a, a badge of my enlightenment, yeah. uh, my release from the bondage of COVID or something. But in fact, uh, you can be vaccinated and still be a transmitter. And uh, from a Bavarian point of view, it was a very, very odd feeling because I could still go out and go to the supermarket, but I had to religiously wear a mask and wash my hands. Even though I personally am no longer that vulnerable, um, so you, we need to know that you might be vaccinated sometime soon, but it's actually not, it's not a, 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 a the cure you think it is for yeah. social interaction. Um, there's, a, there's definitely a sort of statistical moment at which when enough people have been vaccinated, there will be a feeling of liberation. But um, the, the contrast between what you deserve to feel in some sense, and how you have to behave, it sets up some very, very interesting tensions, as I'm sure you will all find uh, pretty soon. Yeah. You know, I think that's right, but it's, it also goes against the messaging that somehow it will all change once you've got it, once you've got the yeah. vaccine. And the story that's being told about the vaccine in the national press, which they don't yeah. really be disturbed, which is that, this is going to take a really long time and we yeah. just don't know whether we will be in a long yeah. time. So there's but something it, it, about it's anticipating. Disturbing. It's, it's very disturbing to walk around the world feeling uh, I'm fine and you're not. I mean, this is a very, very odd feeling. Well, the fact is that you, you're still not impregnable. <laughs> you know, that, uh, you well, I can transmit. You can That's transmit. That's the thing. I can give it to someone else. And you can also get it. You can get it, but you won't die. Oh, don't be telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But it's true. So that, but it mm. means that just the narrative that is being framed, which doesn't take, which basically says, this is a last um, point, hold it together, and somehow we'll be in different waters. And this, the way that that um, anticipated future we didn't expect a second lockdown to be so much worse than the first. Yeah. In June, we had no sense that we could be here in January. And the whole question of how we've been encouraged to anticipate a certain sense of future time is itself exhausting. It's it really is. exhausting to think this is when I'm going to be able to see my kids and then everything changes and everything changes so quickly so that in London we're in this bizarre situation where everybody knows it's incredibly dangerous but the streets are absolutely full of cars people are just not taking any notice mm -hmm. even this morning six o'clock there was massive traffic on the roads as if it was an ordinary day so there's a way that everybody's mm -hmm. dealing with that sense of um, how to cope with and do I believe in and do I trust in the messaging? What yeah. does it, there's a breakdown of trust in Britain that's helped, that's um, gone back to um, um, November or something when uh, Johnson's assistant went to uh, Durham. So there's, there was a kind of break in the contract and then a break of trust and the people feeling, well, I'm just taking these risks for myself. So the whole language of risk, trust, exhaustion, um, contact, dialogue, relationship, all these things are at work, which is why we thought it was really important to come back to where we began from. And we began around a discussion of COVID and we're still in that moment of COVID when we're reading Buber and we somehow need to kind of acknowledge it. And I think there's a moment in Buber, I think it was in Buber that I read about, um, it's never too, you know, you, you can always begin again. Doesn't matter how late you are, you can always begin again. And it feels like we're beginning again in a different term, but we're also in a, in a period where what a lot of what we anticipated hadn't 
come tr through and we're much more exhausted. And it might be helpful before we break today to think about what reflections that means about how best we should continue. You know, uh, Johan and myself have made certain suggestions, but do they work? Are they right? Is the pace and rhythm that we've set out helpful? Or do we somehow think that we need to organize slightly differently? Thanks, uh, thank, thanks, Vic. Um, Artemis, I see uh, uh, you You have a point to make. Maybe that can be the last one, and then I can just very quickly run through next week. So, or was it just a, a comment in the chat? Just in the chat, okay, fine. Um, and, and Peter reminds us that this we, of course, would not be here if 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 it hadn't been for for COVID. But and I think it's maybe interesting to to think about Heidegger's uh, discussion of of the we in that in that section on on Heidegger uh, and what is required for a we to be a genuine community and the extent to which you could say that w that we here we're not wearing masks we can't in infect each other. Um, are we? Is this a, a vicarious community that somehow refers to another real community that is jeopardized, without which this could not exist? But it could be a life raft into into a world in which that other sense of community might might come back in a more real way. Um, so, okay. Uh, th thanks very much for the discussion. Um, I, uh, so, it, it's a very complex thing to take this philosophy with all its, you know, as Vic has pointed out, all, all, also all its sort of universalist, abstract humanist language, but also its its remembrance of the concrete and the, and the relational and the and truth as faithfulness to the reality that's out there, as, as Daniel said, which I think is very important for Buber, uh, to start to sort of think about what does that mean, think through and find a language for the present moment. And so I think that was a, 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 for me, that was a wonderful learning experience to st start to chart this difficult, um, difficult uh, question that we have set for, for the term. And we're going to work through it in different ways. And as Vic said, please also think about uh, whether, you, whether you have any suggestions or think that what we've come up with is suitable or not. Um, so, so uh, let me just, I'm just gonna share, share my screen for two more minutes and then um, uh, we, can, we can stop for today. So, so we thought that we would have already sent this in an email to you that we would look next time at this question of politics, uh, maybe also specifically the Middle East, uh, and that we would do that by, uh, by starting with a discussion of the relation between Buber and Landauer, which is a historical theme, just like Buber and Heidegger, but which allows us pro probably in the same way as we did today to talk about politics. Um, and um, so, yeah, so let's, let, let's, let's assume that that's what we're doing. Um, and then there are two texts for that. So Paths in Utopia, which is a which is book, uh, and that's in, in the, in the folder. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that, Peter. Um, so the chapter six from that book is about Landauer and the relationship to Buber and Landauer. But um, you can read the whole book, of course, but that's what we will focus on uh, twice. And then Michael, Le Michael Lewy, Redemption and Utopia, chapter seven, Religious Atheist and Libertarian Assimilated Jews, which talks about other people as well, among whom Bloch, but also uh, so Buber and Landauer. Um, I will, that's not in the Google Drive folder yet, but I will make sure that it's there by tomorrow. Then we thought we would, uh, so l looking at all those topics that we discussed uh, last time. Uh, oh yeah, Peter Langford says, um, where is Google Photo located? I will resend the link uh, to that to everyone. Yeah. Um, so then we have a session on dialogue therapy ethics. Um, that is the, the, the question that we started with in a way around Rogers. What is the, the therapeutic dimension or the, yeah, how, how do we think about that relationship, looking at it from a contemporary point of view? Um, and there the, 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 the starting point could be the Buber-Levinas relationship the discussion. I also wanted to raise this question of the unconscious in communication. Okay. 
the simple question, does the IDAO relationship allow for an awareness of the unconscious in communication? How does that function or what is the relation there? And what is the importance of the, of the unconscious for our world today? Um, okay, there's a, yeah, I'll, I'll ask Nathaniel to summarize the chat in a minute. Um, and then we would look at conflict revolution, uh, resolution and dialogue with underrepresented and disenfranchised groups. So how is dialogue related to voice? And that might be a very important way to think about some of the things that came up today as well. Um, community relations, which is a theme that Jordan has mentioned in discussions quite often. Now on, on the 8th of March, Anastasia will lead a session that's International Women's Day. We already discussed that before the break on the language and symbolic power, feminist dialogues with Boober. We talked about this gender issue quite often. And that's why we will have another guest talk by Professor Deirdre Butler from the Zelikovic Center for Jewish Studies in Carlton, uh, Carlton University. And that is an ethnographic work. Uh, um, uh, Anastasia, if I'm correct, that's based on ethnographic work, work around uh, stories of Jewish divorce. So that would be, a, I think, a very important topic for us, again, in this in the context of Boober and gender, but also the, the present moment. And then the final session, um, we wanted to then devote to art, music and architecture and this question of Boober's aesthetics and how that relates to the contemporary moment. And you see that there was a nice, this nice mention of art and the aesthetic relationship in the discussion of Heidegger and Heidegger's view of the work of art and how Boober disagrees with that because it's not dialogical. And so, so that is what we have in mind and what we would like to... Uh, the journey that we would like to undertake, but please have a think about it and any comments, just uh, just put them in, in an email and then we can maybe revisit that next time. So we'll start with, uh, well, we will start with this because otherwise it's going to be too difficult to make any changes. We'll start with this topic for next time. So I hope that that is, uh, is uh, okay and, and helpful. And as I said, I'll put that chapter in the Google Drive folder. I think somebody put it, put a, Put a link, uh, Peter. I think Peter Langford. I think somebody put a link already in the. Ah, oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Right, um, Nathaniel. Uh, did we miss anything in the chat, or can you can you? Is there anything we, we need to sweep up? Nathaniel has keep has been keeping an eye on the chat. Yeah. If he is still here. Has he left? Oh, he's. I think he's gone. <laughs> he, he ran away. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no problem. It's right. Information overload. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, overload. That's overload. Exactly. Yeah. The check got too overwhelming. Yeah. Overload. So, uh, Katrina, you had a, you had a, can you just say what that is? You had a reference. Yeah, I was really struck by Artemis's um, comment developing that sort of thread that we had going on about, you know, what is the relationship actually between the medialities or the, the, the qualities of the media and how they they drive, you know, I'm, I'm really liking this semiotic square. So how does, in, in, in what were you calling it, righteous indignation, turn into hatred and turn into storming the capital? Yeah. And, you know, it is a system dysfunction, isn't it? So we have these information systems and they, they're my connections unstable maybe, but it's the, the, the technological information systems that we have are then causing a dysfunction within the social system. I, I think a systems theory perspective can be interesting here. So what I liked about David Orr's work, it's much earlier, I mean, Earth in Mind is late 90s, but he writes there about when water is going through a system too fast, what, what, what effect that can have. Mm. We're looking at water courses and then he, he uses that as an analogy for wider kind of social processes and systems and how they can become dysfunctional. So it just popped into my mind. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks. I noticed that Artemis's response is, is exactly where we're at, you know, it's like, how do, what can we read? And that comes back to Peter's point, you know, a lot of our interlocutors for, you know, are these dead volumes on, on our on our shelves. And exactly. we enter into a dialogue with them in a very different way, because they do help to unclog something. I, I had a, the curious, I love books, as you can tell from my background. I had this curious thing that I thought today, what if I have to leave this city suddenly? Which books am I going to take? And, <laughs> and I couldn't come up with anyone. <laughs> anyone? With any book that I would want to take. Um, so, yeah, I've been thinking about that. Okay, so, so maybe... Who would take any books at all? <laughs> what? 
you wouldn't have to take any books at all. Is that no, I, I think I wouldn't have to take any books at all. No. And then you would write your magnum opus. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Maybe this is, maybe that's all for the best. Yeah, maybe <laughs> exactly. Um, so, but you are suggesting that there is a deep connection between Buber and Luhmann, and that would be very interesting to think about in more detail. Um, Okay. Hey, thanks very much, everyone. This was a wonderful discussion, and um, I think we we started a, um, a very important journey, and I hope that we will continue as we have started today. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. And um, Thank then, you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all back in uh, in two weeks. <laughs>